company this morning and to explore this timely topic in particular because as the East Coast of the United States wakes up this very morning, there will be an, a formal investigation into the very phenomena that we're going to be discussing with our two fantastic scholars today. So as you know, um, over the past few weeks, the world economy has been afflicted with um, a new phenomenon. A number of home traders who usually sit in their homes like we are today and play around on YouTube and on their um, fintech apps to um, raise the value of a particular stock. Reddit, which has more than 3 million members, um, became a forum where these home traders game, came together and um, decided that GameStop stock was what they wanted to play around with. And within a matter of two weeks, they managed to increase its value by 1,500%. In this process then, what happened was a number of issues that are wrong with our stock market and our financial system. And we have come to accept because it's hedge fund managers who do it and make millions and billions out of it and get all sorts of credit for it. These issues became transparent because it became universally accessible and common knowledge. And in this process, a number of factors that have to do with fairness access to information, access to universal participation, moderation, purpose of economic activity, activities, and a number of other issues in terms of what are the responsibilities of individual traders, of organizations that provide economic activity and financial inclusion, or communities of traders that come together to, to advance human socioeconomic welfare became topics, hot topics for everyone to discuss. At this moment, the concern that exists in the, in the United States, it revolves around a document called the Securities Act of 1933. And this morning, Securities and Exchange Commission will be looking at whether uh, they are, they've called upon a number of Redditors who were responsible for this um, cancerous growth and increase in value of a particular stock. While we're looking at these topics then, um, it, it became apparent that really at the heart of this process are a number of principles that need reiteration and, and, and further emphasis and investigation. And as Daniel said, EBBF is, is the perfect conduit for a number of brilliant explorers like our speakers this morning to explore these topics together in an inclusive manner. Let me introduce you to our speakers. First, Dr. Navid Sabet, um, who is an assistant professor of economics at the Goethe University in Frankfurt, Germany. His research is focused in political economy and economic history. And he focuses on distributional consequences of documenting undocumented migrants, which is a growing topic as our world every year has a higher number of migrants than ever before. He has a PhD in economics from the University of Munich and also studied at our London School of Economics and was living here for a while. So it was a pleasure to have him and his family and we're delighted to see him this morning. He's, he's published a number of different interesting articles, one particularly that, that recently explored um, uh, political economy with a bit of inspiration from, from the Baha'i point of view, but more importantly also, well, equally important, I shouldn't say more, equally important, the very basic principles of how economy works and how fair economy must persist. Our second speaker is Mr. John Sonne, who um, is joining us this morning from, from Africa. And um, John is a futurist. He is an incredible human being who keeps um, reinventing himself and uh, presenting um, interesting ways of advancing human society at every level. He is Africa's first um, mem faculty member of Singularity University and he's also a lecturer at Duke Corporate Education. <clears throat> he's written a number of very interesting books, one of which I think maybe two months ago, not even, um, is a recent publication. It's very interesting. It has to do with the, with the dynamics that the COVID world is struggling with. And he co-authored it with one of the most impressive economic minds um, in Africa, Mr. Iraj Abadian. So um, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to see John again. I was honored to host him at another event about his book. 
And we're very eager to see how these two amazing human beings who are exploring the unexplored um, will guide us to better understand the dynamics that have unfolded and how the world could actually, as individuals, institutions, and communities, um, find new ways of advancing socioeconomic welfare. So with that bit of introduction and context, the floor is yours, um, or rather I should say the microphone is yours. Let's start with Navid. Navid, what do you think has happened? What are some of the um, uh, common elements that you see happening today versus what we went through with the market in 2008? And tell us what you see happening before us. Yeah, hi. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you for this very kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to be here. It's the first time I've uh, attended an EBBF event, so I'm very excited. Um, so to the point, to the question, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think, you know, although what's happened with GameStop is not nearly as catastrophic as what happened in 2008, 9 with that financial crash, I do think that both of these episodes um, highlight different aspects of the same problem. And that's an economy that's guided not necessarily by ethical, moral, or spiritual principle, but that of narrow self-interest. Um, in one case, we saw big banks, you know, engaging in, you know, super self-interested behavior with the lending subprime, subprime mortgages. And then, and then today we see, um, you know, these home traders you know, manipulating, artificially manipulating the market for their own gain. So I think in both way, in some ways, both of them are manifestations of the same problem. And I think if you look over the long run of history, by long run, maybe the last like 50 to 100 years, you see that our economy is becoming increasingly volatile um, and increasingly vulnerable to these sorts of things. I think there's one study I read that uh, documented between 1990 and 2003, there were 43 cases of major market crashes, either a currency crash, currency collapse, or something. So this is becoming more and more common. And I think this should provide us uh, time to reflect. Every time there's a major crash, you know, economists write these books, this time is different. <laughs> and yet here we are again. So I think it's really pointing, not necessarily, I think there's cosmetic changes and fundamental changes that need to happen. I think both are equally valid, but I think one without the other isn't sufficient. And my feeling is to date, we focus more on the cosmetic aspect, um, a little bit of right, like, light regulation here or there without changing underlying fundamentals. Um, so what are some of these fundamentals? I mean, there might be many, but I thought to point out maybe just three the first is what Tahar also, uh, already mentioned. I think this question of moderation is an important one. And in some ways, I think many of our problems could be solved by appeal to the principle of moderation. So the question of you know, how much is too much? And what's interesting is that um, up until recently, you know, you'd have to really justify in economics anyway, why you care, for, you'd have to make an economic case for moderation. You know, does moderation lead to economic benefits or not? If it doesn't, why do we need it? Um, so it's interesting. I think there's a growing case even in economics that show the benefits of moderation. So the IMF has this um, paper, this working paper from a few years ago by one of its lead economists that shows that extreme inequality actually hampers the growth of GDP in a cross-country setting of micro studies, like looking at within country variation that also show how inequality within a country can lead to negative economic outcomes. The most interesting of these that I've read is this paper in India where they document the effect of pay inequality on worker performance. And there's two very interesting insights. So first, they find that uh, workers that are in teams that have big pay disparity they perform worse in terms of output and they also skip work more. They call in more sick. But what's even more interesting is that these effects seem to get worse or better depending on the worker's perception of the justification for the inequality. So if they can observe the output of their peer who makes more, and if they see that his or her output is actually way more than his, that person doesn't seem to be as adversely affected by
by the pay gap. But if he turns his shoulder and sees, hey, this other guy's making way more, but he's worse than me, he says, well, this is unfair inequality and that makes it worse. So I think this paper brings to light this question of fair versus unfair inequality. And I think the case for unfair inequality is growing, that it just negatively affects economies from the individual level all the way to the macro level. Um, so that's the economic case for it, if you will. I'm sure there's much more to be said about that. But you know, even beyond that, beyond the economic case for it, I think economics is part of society. And I don't think economic principles need to have a monopoly on social values. So even if there wasn't an economic case for moderation, I think the question is, as a society, what sort of an economy do we want? And I think also Tahar mentioned this idea of cancerous growth. I think in the natural world, unfettered growth of anything is usually not good. You know, within the human body, if cells just accumulate without end, that, that becomes cancer. So even if we didn't have these studies that showed how like inequality was good or bad for growth, I think from a principled point of view, moderation matters. And uh, depending on the type of world we want to build in a coherent, healthy, vibrant economy, which has shared prosperity does require some level of moderation. So the question now is how do we accomplish this level of moderation? I think there are many ways. I think one is at the level of the individual. I think another is at the level of governments and their policies. And I'll say a bit of word, uh, a few words on each of these, um, focusing more on the individual. So in terms of policy, I think achieving that level of moderation requires moderate policy. I think this idea of ends and means have to be, ends and means being consistent is an interesting one. I know there's a lot of calls these days for radical, you know, you know punish wealth or radicalize degrowth de and radical transformation. I, I can't say the merits or demerits of these sorts of things, but I think to the extent that we want moderate economic outcomes, they have to be achieved through moderate economic policy. I think radical policies will give you radical outcomes. So I think ends and means have to be consistent. And one of the ways which governments formulate policy is by paying attention to the preferences of voters. Now, this might not seem like the number one agenda on everyone's mind about voting, but this is where my own research comes in. And I have to underscore its importance. You know, Robert Dahl, he's a political theorist. He says that a key characteristic of democracy is the continuing responsiveness of the government to the preferences of its citizens considered as political equals. So the way governments pay attention to the preferences of citizens, one of the ways is by looking at who votes. And what's interesting is that in recent years, the trend is going straight downwards, less and less people vote. And those who vote are typically better educated, more wealthy, older, wider usually and more male than those who don't vote and those people have different policy preferences to everyone else so i think if we want to have more balanced policy we need a more balanced electorate to vote in those policies um and again it might sound nice to say this but what does that have to do with real economics but again there's many studies that show the real force of political participation in shaping market outcomes. So this is true for African-Americans when they got the right to vote in the US. It's true of women. There's been studies that document what happens to the level and composition of government regulation and spending when women get the right to vote. And you see there's drastic changes. And my own research focuses on undocumented migrants. So in 1986, the US legalized all 3 million undocumented migrants in the US are mostly Hispanics. And the findings in this paper are, are, I think, remarkable. So the baseline finding is that, yeah, once these guys get legalized, governments give more money to them. So again, the composition of spending significantly changes. But the reasons why, I think, are much more important. So in the areas that have undocumented migrants that get legalized, we see people turn out to vote more we see more Hispanics get elected to public office at the level of mayors and school board officials, especially. Not so much at the level of like US senators and such, but at the local level. And interestingly, when you decompose 
the composition of spending, you see spending in education in these areas is what increases the most. So somehow governments pay attention. These guys are now legalized. They mobilize their Hispanic communities. They're more Hispanic school principals, more Hispanic mayors. Okay, we better serve them better. And so, you know, more money goes. So the point here is not to sort of romanticize local participation, but also it is sort of, because right? I think it's easy to sit on an armchair and talk about what governments should do at the macro level. I think they should do those things. I'm not saying they shouldn't. I think absolutely they should. But I think the question of local economies often gets uh, forgotten. And I think that's a crucial point. How robust are our local economies? Do we even know what's in our local economy? You know, do we invest in multinational firms in countries hundreds of thousands of miles away? Or could we also invest in local initiatives and in local projects? You know, if there's a local ordinance that's coming out, do we participate in our society? So I think just as multinationals are somehow detached from the societies that they're in, that's one of the claims against them. I think as individuals, we can also be detached from the communities in which we live and think economics is more at the international macro level than in our neighborhood. And I think these studies really show the power of individual participation in the affairs of society as a driving force to change the economy. So I think next time there's a local issue, we should pay attention. If there's a local initiative, we should, we should support it. Um, if there's time, I just have one other point to raise. And it's about um, the, our conception of individuals. And um, so I think going back to this GameStop thing and this commission or this, uh, this uh, whatever's happening today, I've forgotten the words, the, 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 the investigations that are happening today, those are crucial to investigating you know, what went wrong and how to fix it. And for those who are interested, there's a wonderful book, Who Gets What and Why? It's by Alvin Roth. He's a Nobel Prize winner on market design. And basically the book is essentially about who gets what and why. And the point is, you know, there's been a lot of literature from Adam Smith until Alvin Roth and more, Nobel Prize winner, thinking about how to design markets. Um, and I think, again, we need to pay attention to those things, you know, complete information, perfect competition, breaking up monopolies, antitrust. I think all those things have to be there to build a sound economy. I want to raise one other point that maybe hasn't received so much attention. And it's this, I think many of our societies, Western, Demo even non-Western actually, in increasingly, you know, these democratic capitalistic societies, um, they've placed economic growth as the central dominating process of their societies to the point where all other processes are often subordinated to it. So there's many examples where, like I said earlier, economic principles somehow have a monopoly over social values. Um, and I think this has had huge consequences not just for how our market works, but how we as individuals think about who we are and why we exist. And my argument, my point here is I think to achieve a deeply just social order requires more than a few cosmetic changes, as important as those cosmetic changes are, more than just tax rates and participation and so on. I think we also have to deeply think about who we are as people and what we want out of an economy. And I think that's a huge thing. And there's just one example I'd like to raise with you. It's that of consumption. So it's no secret that after the Second World War, development economists set out to rebuild the world and they did a lot of great work. But one of the things that they tried to do is to expand people's horizons so they would want more. You know, economic growth needs consumption. If people need to consume, they need to want things. And there's this um, wonderful book by Nobel Prize winner, Arthur Lewis. And he says it here, um, you know, wants are limited because the, goods because the goods one knows about are limited. Increase people's wants, sorry, the key to expansion of growth is the expansion of wants. So, and I think many of us feel this, you know, we want a lot of things. But the question is, do we need them? And again, maybe this sounds like a silly point, but I think the line of demarcation between needs and wants is a profound one. So the first question I have is, why do we even invest in the stock market 
to begin with? What is the purpose of that? And I think if that purpose, if we just do it because everyone else does it, well, then we'll ju we're just going to be prone to all these fluctuations and volatilities that, you know, other people sort of create. So I think the question of purpose is really essential. Why do we do the things we do? It's not to say we should or shouldn't invest or we should or shouldn't consume, but I think without having a clear purpose as to what do I really need as a human being and what do I want, I think if that isn't clear, we're prone to encourage the worst tendencies of the market. And two of those I think are greed and an attitude of entitlement. Um, and we'll keep doing that without for, with foregoing the chance to develop maybe these more moral values of how we can live a materially prosperous life in line with moral or ethical principles. And if the evidence till now hasn't shown it that we need these principles to be sustainable, then I don't know what will. And I guess we'll find out in the, in the coming years. But those are just a few points I wanted to raise at the outset. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to hear from you and also from, from dear John. Those are excellent points. Thank you very much, David, for, for being succinct and, and uh, raising some, some excellent questions, uh, in particular, the parallels between the issue of moderation mm. that we started with and, and now this, this notion of greed, which um, really, even with the Black Friday phenomena that we may remember, really greed is what drives a lot of what are yeah. the economic activities centering around stock market and yes. engaging and investing in stocks and so on and so forth. And, and greed and avarice are, are these concepts that are really um, causing or at least accommodating the extremes of wealth that we see where, you know, Oxfam changes the number every once in a while, but it's either 26 or 36 individuals who hold the same amount of wealth as half the planet, 3.5 billion people. And that extreme difference is just worth reflecting, if not anything else, to figure out why is it that three and a half billion people are trying to make a living while 26 million, the 26 individuals have billions that they don't know what to do with. So this goes back again to the issue of moderation, our patterns of consumption, which in our world today, at least in, in, in my corner of the world, being in human rights law, we're really looking at the issue of sustainability. And, and of course, the United Nations has been really trying to, to gain our attention, to focus on the decade of action that we're now in to achieve the sustainable development goals. And in the world of, of, of uh, the private sector, uh, there's the United Nations Global Compact that sets, again, these, these immediate goals that as individuals and as companies and organizations, we need to not only um, admire, but put at the heart of our, our um, operational policies to ensure that we um, allow for universal access to socioeconomic welfare. So thank you very much again for those wonderful thoughts. We'll come back to some of them. There's a lot that uh, you've presented to to unpack. Um, and so now we turn to dear John to hear about his latest um, explorations in this space. Well, thank you very much for having me. And thank you, Navid. That was great to hear those points. I am always enthused at following the future and the past based on two different perspectives. One as an individual, and the other as in the flows of economics or business, and ultimately bringing it around to the responsibility we have as individuals to participate in this future that we're moving towards so that we take this individual responsibility quite seriously. So let me start off with just the individual sort of understanding of where we are and then bring in the context of the rest. In 1996, there was a great book written called The Fourth Turning. And this book was written by two gentlemen called Neil Howe and William Strauss. And they are anthropologists and historians. And they are the actual gentlemen that came up with the idea of baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y, and Gen Z. And so they understand the archetypes of these generations. And what they wrote in the book in 1996 and The Fourth Turning is that they went back to the 1600s and they realized that there are these 80 year cycles that humanity lived through. And within these 80 year cycles, what we have are four other cycles, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And where we are right now is at the end of winter, at the end of an 80 year cycle, 
and we are seeing the implosion and the sort of destruction of all the systems that we trusted so inherently for so long. And if we look at education, for example, or even the socioeconomic system that we're talking about, and even this GameStop scenario, is that these structures that have been trusted for so long don't seem to make sense in the world that we're in at the moment. The last time an 80-year cycle finished, we had World War II and the death and destruction of that world. And in the spring or the early 1950s, we had the formation of the United Nations, the IMF, the Brenton Woods, the dollar becoming the base currency of the world. And that was the beginning of that world. And we are seeing the death and the destruction of that world right now. GameStop is just one of the many ways that the challenge of the structures is starting to happen for us and around us. Now, I want to take you back even further, and let's go back to the Black Death, where in the 1600s or the 1500s around then, where we saw the destruction of most of Europe because of that pandemic that ravaged across Europe. What that did was it ended feudalism and began a brand new process of societal norms and new socioeconomic systems. But we also saw the birth of the Italian Renaissance. And the Italian Renaissance was very much about the celebration of beauty, art, and knowledge. And here we are right now with the death and destruction of the world that we once knew with our own version of a pandemic, which is much more than a virus, but actually a socioeconomic destructive force that we are starting to see right now. And we're about to begin a new Renaissance. But this new renaissance won't be so much about the celebration of beauty, art, and knowledge, but much more about the celebration of our uniqueness as human beings. This uniqueness is really what I think GameStop is about. It's the power to the people rather than the structures. The end of this form of capitalism to begin a new system that nobody can really name yet, but a new system. So the idea of always fitting in is changing to actually fitting out rather than being part of a surplus society. We're wanting heroes some people that stand up that have got individual power that have accessed their genius and are adding that to the fabric of human society. So with this individual power, we have seen the shift of power when it comes to making movements happen. And if we just go back to the Arab Spring, we know that that was brought about by a new collaborative way of communicating and bringing people together. We have seen many of those since the Black Lives Matter movement, the Me Too movement, Greta Thunberg, and now GameStop. So GameStop is just another version of us starting to take our power back and collaborating and starting to topple the way that the structures have been set up for the longest time. So I'm not surprised at GameStop and I won't be surprised at many more of these scenarios to start happening and really start to challenge the way people have been treating the rest of the people. Just like you said, Tare, the system is unjust. There's far too many people with too much and far too many people with too little. But let's move on to business flows because I think also this adds into the story quite well because what we've done as a global system or society, we about 20 years ago began this process of globalization and obviously the internet really fueled it. And because of the internet, we moved on our focus from globalization to digitization. And in the process of digitization, we now are finishing with that and moving to a place of dispersion. And what that means is that the very focus of us going into one place to congregate for education, to hospitals, to restaurants, to head offices are all being shifted and challenged and we are dispersing ourselves into more individual pockets. Now, this has got a positive and a negative. It's got a negative and we can see that loneliness is becoming an epidemic on its own. We see that Japan has just instituted a minister of loneliness because the number of suicides are going up there. We are dispersing in our societal manners. In other words, when we used to drive to work, everybody else was driving to work and you were all listening to the radio and you could be seeing somebody else singing the same song you were. Now we're not going to work at the same time. We're not listening to the same music. We're not doing anything at the same time as anybody else and our society is fracturing. But remember that this is the winter. This is the death and the end of that society. And that very paradigm is shifting. The great inversion is here. 
just like when electricity was um, introduced to the world, it was creating havoc with the gas world. And when cars were introduced to the world, it was creating havoc with the horse people. And so we are now seeing not only Bitcoin challenging everything, but pretty much every touch point of society is in a place of implosion. And when we have that context, I think it gives us peace of mind and also gives us an expectation of that such deep disruption that's happening around us and helps us also let go of our addiction to certainty and wanting things to fit into boxes like we've always had the luxury of. But now we are squarely in a place of uncertainty. And in this place of uncertainty, it becomes our responsibility to either step up and to see it as an opportunity to evolve and be part of this new world, or it becomes something that puts us into a state of victimhood, anger, and frustration. And so if we take this individual ideation, and we also understand that the business flows are changing dramatically around us, there's nothing we can do about it, we must just put ourselves in the right flow, we must also realize that our responsibility becomes of utmost importance. In my new book, I'm writing about this concept called decolonize, democratize, and participate. And where this concept comes from is one of the TED Talks I watched around decolonization, which was fascinating to me, which the guy explains that, and I can't remember his name, I'm sorry, he's a Polish guy, he's got a big name, but he says that um, when Australia was colonized by England in the 1800s, what happened was the, the English arrived and took all the rights of the locals away. Now, this was normal back then, because... When the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Italian, and all these countries went into Africa, South America, and Australia, they took all the rights of the individuals and locals away, something that we see now as disgusting, but then was normal. But guess what? We're doing the same right now. All of us have colonized the future. We are making decisions to impact and ripple the future to future generations without actually even realizing how badly we're affecting their lives and the generations to come. So decolonization of the future becomes a personal responsibility in each and every one of us. And we know we domino effect into people around us when we take that responsibility. The second thing is democratization. You know, it's wonderful to see Kamala Harris as uh, vice president and to see more and more female power and not only female power, but people of color that are moving into positions of power because of the democratization of media, of communication. And we're starting to see that structure also start to implode and we need more and more of it. And obviously, according to Baha'i principles, exactly the same, more variety, more people around the table, making better decisions for everybody that's involved. And lastly, to participate. We all are responsible to participate in this new world. There is no standing on the sidelines. There's no moaning or shaming or blaming governments and the old structures and the economic systems. And we can blame millions and different things. And we often like to sit and moan and shame and blame. And that's just an addiction to drama, an addiction to anxiousness, and an addiction to frustration. And that becomes our responsibility to get rid of and to see the world with opportunities and optimism so that we can take the responsibility to de decolonize, democratize, and participate in this new future. And thank you for those fantastic conceptions of the realities that we're facing today. And perhaps what we've experienced with a number of these examples you've, you've given us um, and Navid's given us, um, what this Redditor movement has highlighted is the range of events that have been taking place that we've just taken for granted and just you know pushed over there without paying attention to it and without participating to ensure that it is healthy and not necessarily just normal and so dispersion that that, that is now taking over following digitization of our global economy is enabling us to really access universalism in having these rights and entitlements. So it may be that it's the winter of something in the past, but as we all know, without dispersing seeds, you know, in the world of agriculture, you will not have real growth. If you just keep all the seeds in one place without dispersing them, real growth never happens. So we're going through a world of incredible momentum and incredible potential. And perhaps we will see legalistically and, and bureaucratically what will happen with the investigation that will take place today following the incident with GameStop. But 
setting all that aside, trying to see the forest through the trees based on these fantastic ideas that you've both shared with us, we really um, need to now find out what are those principles that we could adopt as individuals? Because we're not in a position to make changes institutionally in the United States. And we are not, many of us are not part of those communities of, of tech traders. But as individuals, as Nabi pointed out, we make decisions all the time around consumption. We look at what are our, what are our wants and what are our needs. Um, and if there is one thing to learn from millennials is to really differentiate between those two and to reach for experiences rather than accumulation. So what are some of the thoughts that you both would like to offer us as a group of individuals? How could we um, disperse throughout our spaces that we're in and ensure that we make decisions that have healthy, not normal consequences socioeconomically? Either of you. Navi, do you want to jump in? Shall I go? I, sure, I've, got, I've just got a very quick idea. Yeah, please. Um, I, we, we wrote about this in our last book with Dr. Iraj Abedion. Uh, we wanted to make clear that every single person is actually an activist. We are activists in the way we spend money, who we speak to, what news channels we watch, what energy we're giving to the world, because our reality ultimately is our focused attention. And we think that because it's in the quantum field or because it's invisible to our human eye, that it doesn't really matter. You can have a little bit of a gossip here or you can buy something that has a massive impact on the world in a negative way. And we think it's okay. And But that's where it starts and that's where it ends. And so if we can't deal with the bigger institutional issues, what we can do is starve out the people that are making those sort of bad decisions around the world and not support them. So Iraj and I's main point of the book was, how do we become empathetic activists? How do we become much more in tune with heart and long-term and really start to disengage from our own egos and our own wants and use that as an example? I remember my mom and dad, when we were very young, you know, my mom and dad pioneered to Swaziland. And one of the first teachings they taught me about the faith was, we don't tell people about the faith. We have to act like we are part of the faith. And I remember that so clearly in my mind is that then people can ask us about the faith. And I love that approach because who loves a Jehovah's Witness knocking on your door? And who loves anybody shoving anything down your throat? Nobody does. And we think it does, but it really doesn't. So for me, it's about taking the responsibility that we are all activists. Where do you buy that piece of meat from? Where does it come from? What impact does it have on the world around you? And truth is, people will slowly but surely be inspired by your actions because nobody is wanting to be scolded in what they're doing. And there's a great saying, and I'll end off with this, is your actions are so loud, I can't hear a word you say. And it's always about the actions. Navid? Yeah, thanks. That's very interesting what you say. To be honest, I have to just underscore and emphasize, I, I agree with this idea. I think... Um, Again, it's not to undermine the role of governments and other actors. I think those are crucially important. But as mentioned, you know, each of us here is responsible for our own life. And I think economies are, are aggregations of individual choices. And every choice we make leaves a trace. Every choice we make leaves a trace. So I think in addition to, yeah, reflecting on our consumption is one thing. Again, this question of what do I need? What do I want? I think another important thing is to think about, you know, what is a means and what is an end? And it sounds easy, but I think it can be difficult. So, you know, uh, some things are both like education, you know, that's a means to a better job. It's a means to a livelihood, but it's also an end in itself. Like, you know, it's good to be educated in its own right. But other things are less clear, like money. What is it? Is it a means or an end? And I think it's a means, but often we see societies and people arranging their life as though money's the end. <laughs> so I think that's another thing in terms of individuals to really reflect what is the means that I'm using to pursue an end and what is the end? And to just clarify these things, I think that can also really help at the individual, um, why, again, our consumption. Why do we do the things we do? What meat do we purchase? from the butcher, you know, do we, yeah, all these sort of things, seemingly insignificant ones, I think can really add up 
and they give you an aggregate economy. So if we want a sustainable, healthy economy, I think one big contribution we can make as individuals is to live that sort of life ourselves for our own choices and our consumption habits. Or, or as Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world mm -hmm. through the choices that we make. Yeah. And I think it's important at this point to um, mention um, minimalism. Uh, which is an interesting phenomena that's that's taking over our world after the 1980s and, and the world of greed that became so incredibly popular. Um, it's nice to reflect on how we could lead minimalist lives, materially minimalist lives, mm -hmm. but spiritually. Sorry, there's, there, there's a new term called essentialism. Yes. Which is also nice, which is a bit different to minimalism because minimalism, I often think that I'm just going to have one couch and one cup in my house, which makes me a bit nervous, to be honest. <laughs> um, and I think essentialism is the prioritization of four or five things that you find essential and then really go to town on those four or five things and then, you know, release the rest. So um, I, I think it's difficult to move from that sort of comfort to a minimalist. I've tried and it's like, whoa, I get a little bit like, but I just wanted to say essentialism is also a great sort of uh, approach. So there are all these new ways of thinking. Again, I think I like to thank the minimalists or rather the millennials for these uh, new concepts that are emerging in our world. Uh, because as I said, you know, being a child, a child of the 80s, it, it was a, a, an era of, of accumulation. Um, and, and, and it led to a great deal of destruction um, in, in both emerging and so-called established markets. So we have a, I have a, a couple of questions here to, to share with you. Um, one is from Navid Lancaster. Navid, would you like to say it yourself? You want to just unmute yourself and share it? Maybe not. So Navid says, what do you feel are the short and long-term effects of the influence of the media? And this includes social media on financial systems and our relation to it. Excellent question. Um, I can share a few words. To be very honest, I don't have an answer to that specific question. The research I'm familiar with, um, I know media has received a lot of attention in economics, also in the field of political economics. And the power of media to like influence individual consumption behavior, but also political preferences cannot be understated. There's papers that look <clears throat> at the use of radio in Nazi Germany to explain the rise of the Nazi party. There's papers that show the effect of TV programming by Berlusconi's media set in Italy to link it to his rise of populist rise in Italy. And there's also one like really top-notch papers that look at the effect of Fox News, for example, in uh, influencing Democratic or um, Republican vote shares at the county level in the US. So I think in many societies and in many settings, the role of media has been studied. I'm not exactly sure what its, what its relation is on financial systems and our relation to it. But I'm quite sure that it can have an effect depending on the messaging um, that yeah, it could increase or decrease our, our, our behavior with the financial market. Yeah, so I don't have a specific answer to that question. John? Uh, Mahmoud has put his hand up twice. I just want to say I've, that. I've because seen, he keeps putting it. Yeah, yes. okay. I just want to you. Say. Yeah, okay, good. Um, look, I think it's not just uh into the financial space you know media is an important part part for us to participate in again i think it's also like what about fox and what about those but what about you and what about me and what are we doing to add value to the world and for me i find myself a trojan horse that works with organizations and governments arrives under the guise of profitability but really about consciousness awareness and responsibility which ultimately drives profits in the long run. But I'm, I'm finding myself really becoming an activist inside boardrooms and then using my social media channels to try and share that without being a, a know-it-all, but just to share concepts and ideas that give people some sort of freedom of thinking. So I think not just financial, and it's not just about the foxes of the world. It's all of us in our individual capacity to have this power and a very loud microphone that we can utilize. And I think we should. We shouldn't be shy and we shouldn't be shying away from it. It's a powerful time. 
Well, you know, um, what's happened with, with Redditors and GameStop was really a movement. Um, and um, the Arab Spring that you referred to earlier, John, um, you know, my State Department colleagues referred to it as the Twitter revolution, which was ironic because it really, in the case of Iran, happened on Facebook uh, with the 26-year-old Tunisian who set himself on fire, who really started the Arab movement, the Arab Spring movement. Yes, it was on Twitter, but then when, when you know, we look at the phenomena that also took place a couple of years earlier in Iran, it was on Facebook. So it was individuals sharing their views, um, raising their voices, and affecting change in an entire region over a two-year period. That was phenomenal. So um, what happened also with, with this particular case, as I mentioned, was you know, they had a you know, specific, specific forum. Um, they started to share information about this, this one stock. And look what they did, and rip, the ripple effect of that globally is is huge which is why the investigation is taking place today to see really what happened and what are the safeguarding mechanisms that need to be put in place to to go back to the principles that we you know highlighted in the beginning especially navid but how do we ensure in an increasingly participatory world and universally accessible world our systems are robust enough to allow for sustainable functionality so a uh, very good question. Thank you, Natalie. Um, as I've mentioned in the chat, we have Mahmoud next. And friends, we have less than nine minutes. So please keep your questions succinct and the answers just as succinct to ensure that we finish in nine minutes. Mahmoud, please. Thank you. Uh, putting a few concepts that have been mentioned here together, the concept of moderation, the concept of individual responsibility, the concept of the impact that each one of us can have. There are some tough questions also that come up when you have to make a decision. For example, uh, if you have a good idea, such as the one of EBBF, and you want to promote it, you think of means like Facebook, uh, right? And then you think of Facebook and what it does, like, for example, yesterday having cut off all news in Australia because they are being asked to share part of their revenue with the local media how do we make those decisions what are the criteria and what is the process through which we can make those decisions are individuals in a position alone to make such decisions uh, that's a very great question and very tough one and I, I agree with you you know i use the channels um like facebook but very much disagree with mark zuckerberg and his approach to what he's doing but you also realize that even that new innovation like Facebook is being questioned. The transparency at which they're utilizing their, their platform mm -hmm. is important for all of us to question. Remember that for the longest time, we never questioned any media. Now we are all ganging up against them. And you saw the massive shift away from WhatsApp a couple of weeks ago. And people, most people are back, but that's that's not the point. The point is, we are all starting to realize that we can make massive moves. But if you want to think about the channels that we can use, there are very many neutral channels that we can use. Uh, Clubhouse, podcasts, and these things are our own opportunity to be able to share ideas, not utilizing those platforms that we don't have a sort of value system uh, match against. So I hear you and I share the pain because I really don't like Mark Zuckerberg and what he's doing. So I am also shifting the way I share and on what platforms I'm using to be more in line with value. So I think, I think your question is great because the system itself is eating itself. As you can see, already we're questioning why we're even supporting that sort of business. Yeah, just to quickly add, I think it's a wonderful question. And that's the, that's the thing. I, I think the new world isn't that we're going to overnight destroy this one and then roll out a perfect one in its place. I think we're in this like transition phase where there are these like uncomfortable questions. And, you know, we're trying to build a new world, but we're sort of subject to the tools and procedures of the old world. Um, and I think that's an uncomfortable fact, but I think that's also just characteristic of any organic body that's coming of age. We're in a transition period. You know, the Baha'i writings speak about humanity and transition from like childhood to adulthood. So I think in this process, we're learning to shed habits of childhood and adopt uh, habits of adulthood. And in the process, there's bound to be these interesting questions. But I think through action and reflection on our choices, we can slowly, slowly 
change things. But yeah, it's a very, very good question. Thank you very much. Steve, you're next. Good morning, Jerry. Um, yeah, excellent tool. Thank you very much for that. Um, a couple of, more an observation, I think, than a question, but it may lead into a question. Um, I think if we look at why we why we even know what we know, or the way that we think what we think, um, certainly in the West, we have a sort of mental model that's based on domination over nature. Um, you know, it's it's greed. It's about um, well. So the, the overriding model, if you like, is success equals money, and everything follows that. Um, so that's the sort of mindset that I think we carry around, and that that you know that runs into politics, economics, and the whole sort of gamut of everything that we do. If you if you sort of shift away from that, and it goes away from um, you know consumerism and so on, and so okay, if there was a different way of thinking, what would it look like? And if you then said, okay, success equals harmony which is very much how nature operates, you then run into sort of quantum physics and how the world actually operates in nature and consciousness. And I think where the change can come is rather than focus on what we don't want, which is the old system, and we spend an awful lot of time faffing around in the water, you know, trying to change this bit and this bit and that bit, which will never happen. Whereas if you shift consciousness away from that and say, okay, what is it we want and have a vision of a new, better world based on harmony, then I think you start to make that shift. But I think we spend so much time trying to fix things that we're never going to be able to fix. And we you know, expend a huge amount of energy doing that, and it's going to go nowhere ultimately. Um, and we know now from consciousness that you know, there's an underlying intelligence in the universe, and the decisions that we make and what we think adds to that information that goes you know, out, into the, out into the cosmos. So we're, you know, we're a lot more powerful than we think we are, which comes down to your comments about being individuals. And you know the Dalai Lama said, if you think an individual can't, one individual can't make a difference, try spending a night with a mosquito. <laughs> so you know there's a lot in that, but I think and we, I think we tend to forget that. I think the other quick comment on the back of that is going back to the Googles of this, you know, this world. There's a huge amount of power invested in Google and Facebook and all the billionaires like Gates who are effectively running the show. And I notice Gates has now bought massive amounts of land in America, um, and I doubt that's you know, to, 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 you know to, to be growing organic food. So I think these guys have a huge amount of power which has never been invested in them democratically. So the question is really, how do we undermine that and how do we actually change that from, you know, this, this old mental model, if you like, to the new one and circumnavigate the, you know, the power structures that are already in place? You yeah, have 30 seconds each. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting thing. I just focus on the first part of your comment. I think it's true. I think in the world around us, there's destructive forces and constructive forces. And I think each of these crashes highlights what's wrong with the world. And I think those are easy to spot. I think what's harder to spot are integrative forces. Where are communities learning to work well together, not to point out the bad, but to identify what's good and to build on it. I think that's harder to do, but I think it's possible. And I think there is good. And I think that's where local economies and local communities really come into play. It's easier to align with constructive forces at that level, in my opinion, um, than with the destructive ones. John? Yeah, look, Steve, of course, I agree with you 100%. And uh, I do this with organizations. I get them not to change their old business models, but just to start new ones. I call it today and tomorrow teams. Keep your today team focusing on keeping the lights on, but develop a brand new team and work it parallelly to your existing business to create a new business, rather than trying to get people that were hired for efficiency and economies of scale to think disruptively and robustly rather than efficiently. So yeah, it's exactly that. It's like, let the old world die. Let's start focusing on what we want to put our attention in rather than we don't. And uh, I agree with you 100%. Thanks so much for that. And, and that ties in well with the question that Arlette has, has raised around activism and how um, we create movements in a way that promote peacefulness and respect for others. And what I have found in, in the world of human rights is similar to what you're talking about, John, in, in the corporate world, that yes, it's absolutely necessary to, to um, have a culture of accountability and so to document the atrocities that have taken place, to have a process that, that creates cathartic, cathartic processes that lead to um, uh, establishment of justice in a brand new way. But parallel to that process, which in itself can be quite taxing, 
you need to have the development that goes on and the recreation of culture and character in those communities so that whatever positive change takes root grows and develops. Otherwise, many of these communities collapse again. And that's where we, we end up having repetitive patterns of human rights abuse that lead to, you know, go from genocide to then child abuse to, to trafficking and to all sorts of other issues. So it's, it's necessary to, as you say, have it today and tomorrow, um, not even necessarily separate teams. Sometimes the individuals who are in charge of that process have to keep both aspects in mind to ensure that the steps that are being taken are constructive in their entirety and do not accommodate any further disruption. <laughs>